Angela Hewitt is the kind of pianist who I tremble at the thought of meeting. She's basically a walking Bach god. She's recorded all of Bach's major keyboard works and toured them across the world. She's performed Bach's well-tempered clavier in 21 countries on six continents in a single year. And that's to say nothing of all the honor she's received for her tireless work. Probably out of pity, or just a deep love of Bach, she agreed to meet me. This episode will be a little different than others. For me, as a pianist, it was such a privilege to sit on the same bench as Hewitt as she played, and I want to share that with you. So, we may linger a few extra seconds here or there. Now to Hewitt. Bach has always been with me, not, not just at the piano, but I played Bach on the violin, I played him on the recorder, I sang Bach, I used to dance to Bach, so. Do you find that you have a particular affinity for Bach's music, and if so? Uh... I, I, think, I think it does suit me. It suits me because in my nature, I like to take complicated music and make it sound easy and make it sound intelligible to the listener. That's sort of something in my nature. I like undoing knots, even as a baby and as a child, I liked to undo the knots that my mother tied me into my playpen with. And then uh, also very important is the element of the dance in Bach. Since I was a dancer for 20 years, I started ballet at the same time as piano at age three. So I respond to music with movement. And you know, 95%, if not more, of Bach is based on dance rhythms. In spite of what Hewitt said about dance rhythms or undoing knots, what really struck me from our conversation was her discussion of the emotional and even spiritual side of box music. And that began when we started to talk about Variation 13. Recall where we left off with Variation 12. This is Ben Lottie. Then this is where we begin with 13. This is Hewitt now. The first 12 variations have been all rather attached to the ground, if I may say. Quite straightforward and but with number 13, we're immediately lifted up into another world because it's so sublime. Variation 13 has a lot in common with the opening aria. It's the first music since the aria that is really a slow dance, a saraband, with a beautiful melody on top. So you have the accent on the second beat. One, two, three. One, two, three. So it, it really is related to the saraband in that, uh, in that way, which of course the theme is a saraband as well, you know. So it's sort of the same tempo, I think, as the, as the theme. has this wonderful filigree aria in the right hand with the bottom two voices accompanying that solo. The melody, of course, is important, but the, the two uh, voices we have in the left hand are just as important, you know. He would sing the middle supporting voice from the end of the variation. Let me set the scene a bit. We're at one of Hewitt's friends' homes near Washington, D.C. We're sitting at the piano in the living room, and she's at the center of the keyboard, and I'm peering over her shoulder. It's one of the most amazing musical experiences I've ever had, talking about a piece of music I love with someone I grew up listening to play this exact music. It was hard to ask questions because... I just wanted to close my eyes and listen to her play. One thing I would say about this variation, especially in the second half, the ar harmonies are very beautiful. And there yeah. are some places where you can add rubato if I play the end. This chord 
it here. When I do it the first time, I don't take so much time over it, but when I do it on the repeat, on the second, the second time. There are places in the Goldberg Variations where you arrive and you just want to stay there forever. The end of Variation 13 is like that for me. I had always heard that Bach's faith was central to his music. After all, most of what he wrote was for the church. Cantatas, masses, passions, sacred music every Sunday. What I didn't know was how his faith influenced his secular compositions, like the Goldberg Variations. Bach once wrote that the aim of all music should be nothing but the glory of God and the recreation of the mind. Bach was serious about his faith. He collected religious texts and read them carefully, making notes in the margins. I think for him there was no division between music and faith, no matter what he was writing. No division between beauty and belief. Angela Hewitt told me the story of how she recorded the variations for the first time. It was in a church in London, and for four days they had been recording segments of the piece. You could imagine how draining that is. By sort of dinner time on the fourth day, we had the whole thing in the can, as they say. Then we went to eat and came back to the church late at night. And, and uh, I said, well, let me play the aria again. And I did. And my record producer was then in the, in the church listening with my piano tuner lying on the floor. And they said, well, why don't you keep going? I said, it's, you know, it's 1130 at night. It doesn't matter. Nobody's kicking us out of here. So between 1130 at night and one in the morning, I gave what was the best performance at that point of the Goldberg in my life. It's just sort of mythical. Is that how all the best recordings are made? In a dark church in London in the middle of the night, completely exhausted? I'm embellishing, but it seems like something that could only happen with certain pieces of music. Like, you need to be physically exhausted to then be open to the heart of the piece, which reveals itself when you least expect it. I just love thinking about being that piano tuner lying on the floor, listening to Variation 13 at midnight, looking up into the rafters and wondering, how the heck did I get here? Variation 14 picks up from where Variation 13 ends, taking the same notes even but it changes the mood abruptly. So this variation, number 14, is one of those toccatas for two keyboards. It's written for just two very playful voices. It's sort of a game. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a game that they're both, uh, you know, they're skipping over each other. What's difficult here is also, you know, to keep the left hand very steady. To keep that very steady. And then you have all these hijinks of the right hand crossing over the left and the trills. You know, and to really make the trills clear and in tempo. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a wonderful to watch, mm -hmm. actually, this variation. I think people really enjoy seeing this variation played because of the hand games. Especially as the Goldberg variations progress, Bach is constantly mixing prayer with play. One of my other interviewees, the harpsichordist Christian Nyquist, put it well. Especially in the Goldberg variations, I think you have the balance between the, the more quotidian or, or human aspect or just being <laughs> on earth. <laughs> and you also have the other aspect, uh, call it, calling it transcendental or uh, mystic or... or whatever, because I think that's always part uh, of, of Bach's writing. 
So we have variation 13 up in the heights, then variation 14 with the two voices rolling around in the dust. Then we get to variation 15, which brings us back into a spiritual realm. Bach's faith was in every note that he wrote. And this is one variation where I think you feel that very deeply. Variation 15 is the first minor variation in the whole work. Up until number 13, things are pretty down to earth. Mm-hmm. You know, the number 13th were lifted up already a bit. Number 14th are all these hijinks, and then we're thrown into sort of sadness and, and despair with, with this one. Part of that sadness and despair is created by a two-note pattern that you hear right from the beginning. We have this sighing mode of the two-note figure. Uh, which denoted size in, in Baroque music. And so uh, it's minor and it has these sighs. So obviously it's a very sorrowful variation. At the same time, the harmonic structure of the piece means that there's a ray of hope in the middle of the variation. Normally, when we're in the major key, we start in G major. Then in the second half, we modulate to E minor. from which we rise out through A minor and into G major again at the end. Most of the major variations would be this in story form. Once upon a time, I was happy. Then I was thrown into doubt and sadness, but I found my way back again. In this minor variation, the story is exactly reversed. It's, once upon a time, I was sad and despairing. But still, I held hope within me. And yet, in the end, I couldn't rise above my sadness. These contrasting moods create a kind of tension between hope and despair. That same tension is reflected in the architecture of the two voices that sing to each other throughout this variation. We have the first voice that goes down and the second voice that has the same music but inverted going up. Variation 15 is another inverted canon, a canon at the fifth, By writing a canon in which the second voice mirrors the first, Bach was able to have a falling line in one voice and a rising line in the other. I always feel that the voice that goes down is very despairing, but yet the voice that goes up is full of hope. There's a good argument that Bach saw it the same way. Bach once wrote what's called a puzzle canon for a young theology student. Here was the puzzle. Bach gave the student a single line of music and this inscription, Christus coronabit crucigeros, or Christ will crown the cross bearers. I'm pretty sure Bach could have written the script for national treasure, given his level of crypticness. These two clues, the line of music and the title, were all the student needed to write out the other lines of music that Bach had imagined but not included. With its message of redemption through suffering, the title hinted that the voices in the piece should contrast with each other. The line that Bach gave the student was a sad, descending line that crept down the scale. To create the contrast, to infuse hope, the student would need to write a second line that stepped upward. Bach was calling for another inverted canon, just like in variation 15. All inverted canons have what's called a pivot note, and Bach even hinted at this note with the title, Christus Coronabit Crucigeros. The pivot note was the note C. There's kind of a lesson embedded in the music. That's Rex Eisenberg, a composer. Bach is one of those composers who not only speaks to his religious convictions, but also just speaks to 
life and what we go through as part of the human experience. And so in that way, I feel like Bach is actually composing sermons more so than he's composing music. If you listen to Bach's sacred choral music, he constantly loads the music itself with religious meaning. For example, in the St. Matthew Passion, Christ always sings with chords shimmering around him, as if surrounded by a halo of sound. When Judas sings, though, the accompaniment is sparse. He's alone in the world, the traitor of mankind. It's easy to find examples within Bach's sacred music, like the St. Matthew Passion, of Bach writing the music to reflect an underlying religious belief. It wasn't just that the music was dedicated to the glory of God. It was that, as Eisenberg said, it was conveying its own message about what Bach believed. The Goldberg variations have no such explicit painting of beliefs on the wall, but certain moments still feel like they're telling a story about Bach's faith. The end of Variation 15 is like that. I feel this tug hmm. in the whole variation, which is sort of dissolved at the end when he has the voices going in opposite directions. The voices, in contrary motion, move farther and farther away. It's very bleak. It's very bleak. The final interval is an open fifth, with no third in the middle. A major third could make it sound warm or happy. A minor third could make it sound sad or reflective. But no third? That's like leaving someone in the desert with no water. And it begs the question, will they make it out? It's just so wonderful what he does, what he does there. That's Dan Tepfer, the jazz pianist. The Goldbergs are structured in these two halves. The 16th variation begins the second half. And so it makes so much sense that the variation preceding it would be asking the question. Because when things are in halves, authors know that they have to have a cliffhanger, right? Things have kind of come to an end and you run the risk of, of losing your audience because they feel that things have kind of wrapped up to a certain degree. And so how do you keep them interested and want to read the second half of your book? Well, you ask a question at the end of the, of the first half, right? This is Tepfer playing. So much of a question there. Bach is a masterful storyteller. We're left wondering what lies in store, how we'll escape from this bleak moment. For now, though, here's Angela Hewitt with variations 13, 14, and 15. Thanks for listening.
In this episode, you heard performances by Angela Hewitt, as well as brief excerpts of playing by Ben Lotti, Dan Tepfer, and me on the aria. You also heard snippets of Bach's St. Matthew Passion, performed by the Netherlands Bach Society. As always, I want to thank my editor, David Schreiberg, for his invaluable insight. With this last episode, we've made it to the halfway point of the piece. But before we step into the second half, we're going to take a brief detour to see one composer's transformation of Variation 13 into an Afro-Cuban jam. Join us next week for a whole lot of fun with composer Jeff Scott. Thanks for listening. (laughs) ¶¶